Welcome everyone. This is Shobha from CNS. And despite innumerable challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, we are back today with the fifth episode of APCR SHR 10 Dialogues. This is a special series of online interviews every fortnight with leaders in the Asia Pacific on the theme of sexual and reproductive health and rights in the Asia Pacific the 2030 SDGs vision and the 2020 realities as we face them. This is also the theme of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights or what we more commonly call APCR SHR 10. And for the benefit of our audience, I want to tell you that these dialogues will be streamed live on Facebook pages of APCR SHR 10 and CNS. In today's episode of APCR SHR 10 Dialogues, we have with us a formidable duo of Kathy Wynn, who is Regional Coordinator of Asia Pacific Network of Sex Workers or APNSW, and Alexandra Jones, Executive Director of Asia Pacific Alliance for Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights, APA. Welcome Kathy and Alexandra and all force to women power today. Uh, I, I just hope Kathy is there online. And meanwhile, uh, before we begin, I will make a just few housekeeping announcements for the viewers. Uh, please mute yourself and keep your videos turned off while the panelists present. So you have that, uh, the video and the, uh, mute, the microphone button in front of you. So uh, please uh, mute yourself. Uh, also, those who are using the Zoom platform can type in your comments and questions in the chat box, even as the panelists present. Uh, and unmute yourself to speak at the end of the dialogue. Or you can raise your virtual hand. If you are watching it on Facebook Live, you can leave a comment there and we will try to take up as many comments as possible. Please keep your questions and comments short, crisp and precise so that more people can get a chance to have their say. Uh, so we begin without losing any more time. Uh, we are living in difficult times indeed. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm based in India. I'm operating from the confi confines of my house and um, I am sorry to say I have a very weak internet connection as of now and I'm just praying that goes off very well without any major hitches. But please pardon me if uh, you cannot hear me in between or cannot see my video. That will be because of technology. A coronavirus disease or COVID-19 as we call it, it is not just a public health emergency, but it has also challenged every aspect of our lives and has, is having a more severe impact on those who were already struggling against a large range of inequities and injustices and human rights violations. So let us begin with uh, Alexandra. Alexandra, how is COVID-19 impacting sexual and reproductive health services, including access to safe abortions in the region, especially in areas of lockdowns? And what will be the long-term repercussion? Over to you, Alexandra. Thank you so much, Shilba, for that really um, very important and timely question. I know it's hard for everyone right now. We're all being impacted by the COVID crisis. Um, and in terms of SRHR, of course, there's going to be several um, strong uh, impacts on SRHR. Um, I think if we start at one level, we can look at the healthcare system. Um, at, oh, <laughs> I think someone needs to mute. Okay. Um, a lot of pharmaceuticals are currently manufactured in China and India, and of course, those plants have at least temporarily been closed down. So we're looking at shortages of medications and supplies, including ARVs for people living with HIV. Uh, you're looking at um, blockages for contraceptives and antibiotics. And actually in 
what I wanted to mention was there was an article yesterday um, from one of the biggest manufacturers of condoms that are actually, they're based in Kuala Lumpur. And they have said that they've had to shut down their plant and they're predicting that there will be a global shortage of condoms because of this. Um, secondly, if you look at the health system, of course, because so many medical staff are focused on COVID, um, it means the system is overloaded. Um, there might not be as much uh, capacity to, um, to attend to women who might have reproductive health needs, like women who are pregnant. And of course, there's a huge risk to doctors themselves. I think in Philippines uh, last week, over 10 doctors um, died because of COVID. So there's a huge impact on the system. Um, and uh, yeah, very sad impact. Um, I think what I wanted to point out that right now is that the role of family planning clinics, of course, is very important because they are helping to deliver services in this very restricted time to the best of their ability. They're trying to remain open to provide information and uh, access to contraception wherever possible. Um, the second point that I wanted to make, of course, is that there's a huge impact on the individual level, uh, especially as Shoba mentioned earlier, um, inequalities are exacerbated in times of crisis such as this. So if you look at a lot of the advice that's being given out by WHO or by governments of the region, it's actually your ability to protect yourself is very privileged. Um, people are being told to wash their hands repeatedly, but that assumes, of course, that you actually have access to clean water and sanitation facilities, which not everybody does. Um, you're also being told to socially distance, which of course is again a privilege. Many people are living in very confined situations. Migrants and refugees, for example, um, are not able to socially distance themselves. So they're not able to protect themselves that way. Uh, and including, again, I myself am able to work from home and I realize that I'm very lucky to be able to do so, but many, many people are not able to do that. And they're either out of work or having to put themselves in very dangerous situations and at risk. And I think um, one, very good example of that is sex workers. Um, they're not able to just stop working. Um, and I think Kathy, I'm sure will go into more detail about that. Um, the third point that I wanted to make again is that this response by a lot of governments to impose curfews or lockdowns is not necessarily making a very safe environment for everybody, especially for um, women who might be living in unsafe situations. There's been evidence already that rates of violence against women and children are increasing because of the lockdowns. Um, and finally, you know, reproductive health needs, reproductive and sexual health needs don't stop because there's an epidemic. So women will still need access to abortion um, services, for example. Um, and this is something which is very timely and can't wait. So we really need to make sure that abortion is recognized as an essential service. Uh, and I think I will wrap it up there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alexandra. And you're very right in saying that when there is water not available for drinking itself, and we are expecting everybody to wash hands, I think sometimes it, it becomes very challenging. Uh, another thing which you brought out was uh, about the lockdown having so many adverse effects, especially on women. And I think recently I read a news item that there has been an increase in domestic violence in some countries, about a 30% increase in domestic violence uh, due to uh, uh, this lockdown of COVID. Uh, I'd like Kathy, uh, what about the impact of COVID-19 on sex workers community in the region uh, specifically? Uh, not only in terms of SRA services, but also in terms of their general health, safety, income, etc. Yes, Kathy. Kathy, are you there? Yes, sorry, I was on mute. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> hello, 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 welcome. <laughs> hello. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, what I have seen is that since uh, last uh, in February, when this COVID issue was come out, then everybody had the concern, including the sex worker, if it is, it is more than how we will be continue working. 
So it is now is uh, coming to the impractical issue. So example in the many country now sex worker are facing problem because of the bar and restaurant and all that they are working places the closed down. And as Ella had mentioned, the now the many of the health provider and the the hospital worker they are focusing on the now on the COVID treatment, not not really on the on the the sexual health or the HME treatment like before. However, uh, as the community organization, I have a contact with the, some of our member how they are working currently. So they have con uh, they are working in the community level to the distributing of the condo and lubricant and also the providing the sexual health services is as much as they can. So this is about the, the how community uh, try to be effort in this situation. That is the good opportunity also one point is the how community led uh, exemption. You know, it's the now in the many people, uh, many health provider and health worker are more focused on the COVID-19. So they are almost to be forget about the HIV and other health services. So that is the good thing that now community, we are trying to be working in the community level, including the gender-based violence and reporting to the, if in the, the area where they are staying or where they are working, if anybody is symptom of the COVID and they can also report it to the authority people. So this is how communities start involved beside the sexual and HIV. Right, right, thank you. Uh, communi yeah. Yes, communities bear the brunt of it and communities have to come together to yeah, um, yeah. fight it. Yes, right. Yes. yes, yes. <laughs> and, and also the, um, I'm also seeing the example now, I'm, I'm stuck in the Myanmar because yeah. I came back before, so okay. now I can't go. <laughs> so what in the, in the grass, grassroots level, what I'm seeing here is the, the community, uh, you know, is that they close all the working place, uh, the karaoke, massage parlor, nightclub and restaurant. So they have no client. And also they are, you know, it's the much concern about that their income because that time and they cannot think about the COVID also because of their daily income, the, how they have to support that their family and parents. So this is another thing. How, and in the movement restriction was also responsible because now is yes. the some of the township and city are locked down. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing, yeah. And no treatment for the other health problem right now because its priority is the COVID. Yeah, right, right, right. Even I'm locked down, Kathy, in my house. <laughs> <laughs> we are almost yes, also all of them. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. I would request the participants, uh, except the panelists, not the panelists, but the participants. Please mute yourself and switch off your videos so that we can see the beautiful faces and hear the good things spoken by the panelists. Uh, now the theme of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights or APCR SHR 10 is SRHR in Asia Pacific, SDG 2030 vision and the 2020 realities. So Alexandra, are we on track in terms of the 2020 realities and the 2030 SDG targets for SRHR in this region? Where are we actually at the moment? <laughs> Thank you for that question. That's also a very, very timely question right now, actually, because today is the first day of the Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development, which of course is the regional body or process that has been put into place to monitor progress on the SDGs in Asia and the Pacific. As part of this, um, SCAP has reduced, reduced, sorry, released their annual report, um, their annual progress report on the SDGs. And to be frank with you, um, to be blunt about it, it's um, very clear that Asia Pacific is actually not on track right now, and we are not on track to achieve any of the 17 sustainable development goals. Um, the other point that the SCAP 2020 report makes is that inequality in the region is actually growing, and that the economic gains, gains that have been seen are not really translating into poverty reduction. And of course, we know that women are overrepresented in poverty. Um, if you look at SRHR specifically, of course, there's 
SRHR has links across the entire Agenda 2030, um, all of the goals, but specifically um, SRHR is in directly included in two of them, and that would be goal number three, which is healthy lives, uh, and goal number five, which is gender equality. Um, in terms of progress on those two goals, there are some parts of healthy lives where that we are, there has been pro, um, progress has been seen in the region. Uh, specifically, I'm looking at rates of maternal mortality are getting better. Um, however, if you look at, for instance, goal number five, it's goal number five is really off track right now. And in fact, there's a lot of data missing from goal five to even monitor progress itself. Um, the, what I also wanted to mention in regards to sustainable development and um, monitoring at the regional level is that APA participates in uh, the regional civil society engagement mechanism, which has been set up as an interface between SCAP and civil society um, to engage on these Agenda 2030 reviews at the regional level. Um, and ARSEM as a body, it's the acronym is ARSEM, um, has identified a number of systemic barriers to sustainable development specific to this region, all of which have links to sexual and reproductive health and rights. And I will very briefly go over those um, systemic barriers right now. Uh, the first one, of course, is the neoliberal corporate system that we're in right now, which of course favors uh, the few over the many. Um, and as we know right now, there's a very famous Oxfam, I think, um, statistic that has come out where, which says that the richest 85 people of the world own as much as the lowest 7 billion. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, women of course are overrepresented in this lowest 7 billion. Um, the second systemic barrier that they identify is the militarism in the region, which is diverting a lot of funds away from social services, including sexual and reproductive health services, of course, and other health services. Um, the third barrier that they um, identify for this region is labor exploitation. Um, of course, there's a huge amount of gender discrimination in the workforce. And added to that, that the majority of care work in the region is um, undertaken by women and girls. And a lot of it, the vast majority of it is unpaid and undervalued. Um, the fourth one is land and resource threats. Of course, we're looking there specifically at things like climate change, which is actually, unfortunately, the impacts of climate change are increasing right now. And again, are disproportionately affecting women. Um, and of course, land rights, where women are often um, in some areas are blocked from inheriting land. Um, and then of course, the last one is, uh, which is very significant for sexual and reproductive health and rights is patriarchy and the rise of authoritarian systems in the region, which is simply reinforcing these very unhealthy and unequal gender norms um, and leads to things like preventing women from accessing SRHR services, information and education. Um, for instance, sex workers might have a lack of agency to negotiate for condom use, um, it reinforces these um, uh, unhealthy, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're not, anyways, bad practices like um, FGM and early and child forced marriage. Um, and it, yeah, it just perpetuates this whole idea of women as being here for reproductive use only. So um, those are the main barriers that the RSEM has identified as facing the region right now. Uh, thank you, Alexandra. Kathy, can you uh, please elaborate on, uh, in terms of what is happening with, for the sex workers community? Are we, where are we in terms of their sexual and reproductive health and rights in the region? Um, I think it's, uh, we are almost same about when we talk about the sexual and reproductive health in the, our region. Mm -hmm. uh, we are almost the same, but the, the also the issue is the one in the, however we had the policy in particularly the sex worker are still like uh, access for the SI services mm -hmm. and also the, the behind. 
because when we talk about the SI services in generally the the more focus on the uh, in the general women, not to the sex workers. So what I have seen is that uh, currently many of uh, as APNSW we are working on the responding to the Janavis violence. So in that case that we got a lot of reporting are uh, the the sexual uh, abuse and which had you 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 already know about the when people do the sexual abuse they never use the condom. So it is the rape case and as well as the the sex worker they get and when the pregnancy and also on the other hand when they get they get pregnant and they had no safety for the abortion or the country have no system for the unwanted pregnancy. And some of the sex worker, even they are in there during the pregnancy, when they are working, they had no PMCD services or the no sexual reproductive health services for them. So, you know, when we look at to the, in the sustainable development goal, they had the, we, as the sex worker community, we can't focus on the development goal because we have lack of human resource and lack of financial resource and lack of technical resource. So in that case, what we do is that which are the priority. We look at the priority goal, which we can focus on. Then we work like the, uh, uh, in partnership with the women organization or the other regional organization like we're working with ERO and also the, the Alex and the, the for the Social Reproductive Health Alliance. So it is how we try to be working in the regional level as well as we are participating on the on the UNHPCB had the survey for the young uh, sex worker for sexual reproductive health and aging sex worker. Uh, but still they have uh, a lot of needs and also the, the action are slow taken. Because why I'm saying the action are slow taken, example from the last year in 2018, I haven't uh, participated in the UNX, UNX meeting, uh, PCB meeting for the, the aging sex worker who need for the sexual and reproductive health but it's not here we don't hear any policy having double audit anything have to be uh, have had the policy or the engaging on that so it's still there have a lot of gap for the sex worker and social reproductive health okay uh, are there any uh, best practice examples are there any countries doing better than the others or can there be some spark of hope in this um, I think it's the, according to the uh, APNSW, we do have the, some of the project. Actually, the project was uh, for the gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, when the sex worker, uh, the paralegal staff, mm -hmm. when they go to the brother or karaoke or massage parlor, they cannot tell directly for the gender-based violence. So they start introduction about their health and prevention HIV and social reproductive health. Mm -hmm. So then that what the, the, that is the their entry point to prevent the gender based violence. So what we have found is the some uh, example in the three country we have four country in the project. Mm -hmm. We found that three country was good progress. Mm -hmm. So sex worker can get the social reproductive health in the community-led organization. Mm -hmm. And one country was also that they're not providing clinical service, but they are working on the referral services with the national aid program, which is the government. And also the, the some country are they are working on the referring to the uh, the NGO who are providing the health services. So this is that we had see the good three country have good progress. But as you know, is that as I say earlier, we have very limited resource and human resource. Everything resource is limited, so we can't do so far. That's why we try to work with in partnership and collaboration with the other organization, who other regional organization who have the same goal with APNSW or believe the sex work as the work and who support us. Yeah. What are those three countries? Can you name them? Yeah, actually, it's the interest in Nepal and Bangladesh and Myanmar. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, because Nepal now they are providing their uh, clinical services led by the community organization. So they are providing their as sexual, uh, sexual uh, health services, including HIV, STI and the SI services. Mm -hmm. And the other two countries like Examiner for Myanmar, they are working closely with the National AIDS Program and Township Medical Officer. Uh, for the providing the the SI services and also including the PMCT, and Bangladesh also they are working with the women rights organization and also the referring to the NGO for SI services. Uh, Alexandra, would you like to add something to that? And uh, what about Thailand? Where does Thailand stand, or uh, any other country examples you would like to take, Alexandra? Sure, you're wanting me to add more of a spark. Yes, of yes, 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 yes. <laughs> um, I mean, I wanted to preface, I wanted to tweak the question a tiny bit by saying that, um, I mean, no country has, a, has yet achieved fulfillment of SRHR and no country, similarly, no country has achieved um, gender, uh, gender equality. Mm -hmm. um, but we're all slowly, all countries are slowly making progress mm -hmm. uh, overall. Mm -hmm. um, and that there's no, I mean, there's no perfect country, right? I have lived in Asia for over a decade now, and it's very much my home, and I love it here, and it, it feels like my place. But originally, I'm from Canada, and oh. Canada is one of those countries that you might think of as having, like, a good SRHR system. Mm -hmm. um, nonetheless, there's still a lot of work to be done there as well. For instance, if you look at um, abortion has been legal for many, many years in Canada, and yet it's not widely available to everyone in the country. If you're in an urban center, yes, no problem. You can access abortion. But if you're in a rural area, it's much more difficult and you have to travel. Um, similarly, if you want to look at things like MMR, maternal mortality ratio, um, there are still dis large discrepancies there. Um, we have a very good MMR for the general population, but our indigenous communities have much higher rates of maternal mortality ratio and other things like tuberculosis. So it's all a matter of, you know, every country has things that they need to work on. Um, what I wanted to say about Asia Pacific specifically is, is that there have been several um, very positive developments. Um, legal developments over the last few years. Uh, one specifically in India, which was the very famous section 377, which was overturned, I think it was two years ago now. Um, and that is the section which categorized gay sex as an unnatural offense. And of course, this is a famous section because it's been, rep it's a, uh, it's a, how do you say, it's from the old colonial system, so it's in a lot of the legal systems in Asia, unfortunately, it's a very negative consequence amongst others. Um, and so that's a great, I mean, I think it took a long time in India for that to happen, but it was, it's really a great win for the region that that happened in India. Um, again, it is similarly in Pakistan, um, the transgender rights law passed about two years ago, which, you know, enshrines um, rights for transgender people and eliminates discrimination against them. Um, and on abortion, I think New Zealand uh, just last year finally managed to decriminalize abortion. It used to be under the criminal code and they finally, they're just in the process now of moving it under their health policy. Similarly, there's also good news in Thailand, actually. I think about two months ago, um, the constitutional court here mm -hmm. has ruled that the section on abortion, which is in their criminal code, is unconstitutional and that it violates principles of equality and liberty. And so they're just at the very beginning of their process here of decriminalizing criminalizing abortion, but that's really exciting, I think, for people in this region. Um, and I think the one one more point I wanted to make, if you allow me. Yes, please do. <laughs> is that for civil society in general, I, I think there are a lot of, um, one great thing is that there are a lot of tools out there for us to use in order to help hold governments account to account. There have already been a lot of commitments that governments have made to sexual and reproductive health and rights, which are in being in the process of implemented or still need to be implemented. And beyond Agenda 2030, which is broadly looking at sustainable development, we have much more specific tools like the, which monitor progress on SRHR, like the International Conference on Population and Development. 
uh, which is basically the roadmap to sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, and of course, in Asia Pacific, we have something called the Asia Pacific Ministerial Declaration on Population and Development, which contains very specific uh, advice for Asia Pacific governments to achieving SRHR, and they've all signed up to it. Um, of course, there's also the Beijing Platform for Action, which is um, on women's rights and, of course, is having its 25th anniversary this year. And then finally, um, I also just want to highlight that there's a number of tools within the international human rights system as well, which can be used um, to fulfill um, sexual and reproductive health and rights, uh, including CEDAW, which is the Convention on Women's Rights. We have the CRC, which is on child rights. Um, we have the Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, um, which address the right to health and many others. So I think that that I also see as a spark of hope for the region, that there's so many tools out there that we can use. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Alexandra, in fact, you have mentioned this uh, before, uh, I think also, but could you just um, pinpoint what are the main challenges and barriers that are being faced in this region to make SRH services available to everyone, where as uh, the SDGs say, no one is left behind? Yeah, I think in my previous answer, um, I definitely looked at, or I talked about the systemic barriers. Um, one of the other, um, one of the other priorities for the region is to remove or repeal all of these discriminatory laws and policies that are still in place. And the tools that I just previously mentioned are um, tools that can be used to do, that, especially the international human rights system can be used to hold governments to account. Um, but for instance, I think in Asia, still some 20 countries um, have outlawed same-sex activities. Uh, access to abortion is still quite restricted in most countries uh, of the region. Um, and again, things like early and child forced marriage and female um, FGM are still being practiced. So these are all areas that we need to improve on. Um, the one other point I wanted to make is that there's a huge data gap as well, that we need better and more data around sexual and reproductive health and rights, which will also help, help with civil society to monitor governments. Um, I think if you look at Agenda 2030 in the same report that I highlighted earlier, which was the SCAP progress report of 2020, um, they report that um, of the 169 indicators of Agenda 2030, only 42% of those are able to be covered right now. In the, by, they have data in the region for them. So that's less than half still. Um, added to that, there are, within sexual and reproductive health, of course, there are some issues which we have a lot of information about and there's some issues which we don't have a lot of information about and we really need more. So things like um, maternal mortality. Okay, we already know a lot about this and we're tracking it and CPR, which is contraceptive prevalence rate. Of course, we have a lot of data on that. But what we don't have are things that are a bit more, more of the um, sensitive topics. Uh, around comprehensive sexuality education, um, sexual orientation and gender identity and expression, uh, access to abortion, more specific information about where, what those barriers are and specific groups that are being blocked. Um, and as well, very little is actually being done around sexual pleasure, which of course is part of sexual rights as well. Uh, Kathy, could you just uh, tell us uh, barriers uh, specific to the sex workers in the region, which they, they are facing uh, to make uh, in the path of making sexual and reproductive health services available to them, specific to the sex workers in the Asia Pacific region? Um, yes. I think it's uh, one. <clears throat> We need to talk about the specific area. As I mentioned in the Sustainable Development Goal SDG, we only we try to be focused on the three SDG, which is also the link to the CEDO. And CEDO, now we are trying to be work outside of HIV and on the link into the SDG and CEDO. So we and they have, I see the um, most of the country in the gap are for 
as I just said, it's for sex worker uh, legal information and also the the actually it should be the accessible and affordable for the sex worker because still some country are not accessible and also they're not affordable when when might be the policy maker when they hear why not affordable because as you know that the in the even in the sex worker community they had the different uh, types of the sex worker and different income they are working. So example from the street based sex worker and brother based sex worker for uh, uh, to get the uh, the inject for the, the SI services as they have to pay the money. Some community member they cannot afford and some country they are still not available and some country they had the available services but they have legal information who are providing and what services so i think that's the legal information and legal of, uh, accessible is the the big barrier so example in the the some country they have uh, the the other process and they have the treatment or um, they had the services are available, but no accessible information. So sex workers do not know that because why I can say is the last year <clears throat> we did in the training, during the training, we were discussion about the, the how the sex worker are accessible for the SI services. So those are mostly a lack of access or information and also the lack of affordable. So even though they, they, they don't have, they, they want to be there, uh, they want to take the SI services, but they don't know where to take and who are providing and what kinds of services. So it's, this is the barrier. Okay. Uh, so Katie, from your experience of working in this field for so long, uh, what is your recommendation for countries and governments in the region to do more to ensure that uh, SRS services are available to sex workers? You have pointed some of the challenges. What do the governments need to do? Um, I think it's the sex, uh, the, the government or the policy maker, they have to be acknowledged the experience and expertise of the sex worker community. Why I'm saying is that because the sex worker community, they know that where is the, their community member and how they can provide and how to hand over, how to work with the, their community member. Currently, the, I'm seeing that is the many of the, the government or policy maker, they do not acknowledge the, the experience and expertise of the sex worker community. And they're not acknowledging the how ever community member are effort. This is make also us to be the tire with working with them. Uh, okay, uh, Alexandra, would you like to add something to that? What what needs to be done more specifically uh, by the countries? So I, I wanted to underline actually what, what Katie was highlighting here and that engaging civil society and, and community at every level of decision making and is imperative to ensuring um, an effective and appropriate response, um, both policy making and programs. Um, as we, as she was saying, uh, communities in Myanmar right now are the ones that are, are picking up the slack and providing these services for sex workers and other marginalized communities. So it's really important that that expertise is recognized and supported by governments. Um, I think the other thing I would urge for is, is better data and to engage civil society in engaging um, in data generation. Um, and especially qualitative data, because that tells so much more of the story than just statistics do. You don't hear about the who's and the why's and the how's with, with quantitative data. Um, yeah, my third thing I would just urge for is more funding for civil society, because a lot of these organizations that are doing such great work are operating on these shoestring budgets. So just supporting them, um, including financial support to keep doing the great work they're doing in SRHR advocacy, in research, 
in um, service delivery, I think that's one of the key things also that needs to happen. Yeah, um, uh, I also want to add to okay. point is that there had that should be the quality of services for the SI services. Mm -hmm. And then also the evidence based data collection. So what we this this will be the cross uh, to the previous your question and this one, mm -hmm. because um, when the community member we try to get the data evidence base and they had the, a lot of process to get you know the government approval and authority so we could not afford in within the our limited resource and limited time that is the one of the challenge also on the other hand we try to get the evidence based data so then we can advocate for the authority and, and law policy maker and on the other hand, we can also educate to the community member that, hey, this is we for how we can do better services, mm -hmm. uh, how to engage better. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Alexandra, you mentioned uh, financial constraints. Uh, do you foresee that COVID-19, the aftermath of that, may still tighten the budget strings? And uh, uh, because I think uh, the whole economy has been turned topsy-turvy because of it. So do you foresee the repercussions for funding in the SRH sector? I, I wish I could say no, yeah. <laughs> but experience yeah. tells me that yes. probably yes. Yes, there yes. will be repercussions, especially for this for civil society. I mean, even if you look the first initial reactions, if you look at the UN level, were um, in, in processes like CSW, the first things to get put and CPD actually, the first things to get put aside were um, the civil society side events and civil society um, engagement with the process itself. So I feel like this is just an indication that civil society is often seen as, as not, not necessary to the process. Um, so I, I fear that going forward, because of such a strong impact on the economic systems everywhere, um, yeah, it will affect our work. And then, uh, yeah, it, I think it looks, I mean, it's a sign that the system really needs to change, actually, um, because even our health systems, even countries that have strong health systems are still not able to deal with this effectively. So, so much more money needs to be put into health, including sexual and reproductive health. All right, all right, right. very well said. Uh, we have the World Health Day on 7th April, almost a week away. And this year's theme is Health for All. And in these times, it was never ever so critically relevant with the heightened crisis due to COVID-19. Uh, can you please share your message, uh, Alexandra and then Katie, for World Health Day 2020? Yes. World Health Day, I think just, I have to, looking at the timing of this and looking at everything that's going on in the world, it really speaks to this need for really strong health systems and yes. sexual and reproductive health. These needs have never been seen so clearly as they are right now. Um, people don't stop needing access to contraception. They don't stop needing access to information. They don't stop needing access to, women don't stop needing access to abortion services. So all of these things are, are um, imperative for inclusion. Um, it's also crucial that governments ensure that they're taking a rights-based approach to health. Um, engaging CSOs and communities in the health response, uh, ensuring that CSOs have funding to continue. Um, and really, CSOs are the ones, C CSOs and CBOs, sorry, are the ones that are really reaching the communities that are most in need. So it's imperative that we continue to work with CSOs and support them to do this work. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we'll never be able to realize sustainable development either. <laughs> right, right. So, Katie, what's your message for the World Health Day? I think my message is the you know in the HIV when we were start working on that they had have the it's the lack of community involvement. So it is so far now you see how the community meaningful community involvement are how effectiveness. So when the crisis has can community are come up because they need, they know that this is they have to do. Is this the same for the, the health, what you are asking for the message? I think the community led 
is the key to be success in every way. So, and then also the, um, the working with the community is not for the tokenism, it should be the meaningful participation. And also looking for the sustainable or the community organization as well as in the CSO. I mean, the when we talk about CSO is the many different definitions. So I also focus, want to focus on the looking at to the sustainable development of the community organization and community movement. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kathy and Alexandra, for a very enriching discussion. We have a lot many questions which are pouring in and a lot many people wanting to ask questions. So <laughs> now I invite the viewers for their comments and questions. And uh, I would just repeat that if you are using the Zoom platform, please type in your questions and comments in the chat box, which you must be seeing on your screen. If you wish to speak, unmute yourself and then ask your question or raise the virtual hand. And if you are watching this on Facebook live, you can leave a comment there. Uh, Hello, now, Soba. Yes. I, I just want to ask one question to panelists. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Kalpana from Nepal. I'm a health journalist. Uh, I just want to ask question. Uh, we know that uh, today the main priority is on COVID-19. So all focus is on COVID-19 patients. So uh, women and their SR HR is ignored at this time. So how would this situation affect in future? What is your opinion? What do you say? Okay, any of the panelists would like to answer that? Okay, um, for the APNSW and as the, for the sex worker community, what I can say is that we are the membership-based regional, regional sex worker network. So in, during this day, we are communicating with the, our member and currently what is the, their action on the sex worker and needs of the sex worker. So when you specifically mention on the Nepal, I have checked with the, my, uh, our member from the Nepal in yesterday. And they say that men, they had the many sex worker are facing problem on the, the needs. So what, what we have start thinking about is that we will be looking at to their priority needs. In this time, we cannot focus on many things. We have to think about which are the priority and how we can support better support to the sex worker. So this is currently we are on the end of discussion. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, I would uh, like to invite Liz Hilton, who is here with us today, to share her thoughts. Uh, as we know, Liz is the founding member of Bangkok-based Thai Sex Workers Associate organization called Empower Foundation. And this has been working with sex workers for more than 30 years. Uh, Liz, we are very curious to hear from you. So over to you now. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, it's good to listen to Alexandra and Katie as well. Um, just to be a little bit clear though, I'm not one of the founders of Empower Bangkok. Mm -hmm. uh, I came later. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so it's nice to have opportunity to talk with you all. Uh, what we're seeing generally, and I think people have already spoken to this a little bit, COVID is exposing and uncovering many strengths and weaknesses in society and in our movements as well, no? Liz, Liz, can I interrupt? Can I interrupt? Can we see your video, please? No. No? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, you okay, can't. okay, go on. Okay, go Te on. Technically, it doesn't, it can't. So, okay, okay no. Okay, okay, okay fine. Sorry. Yes, okay. please continue. You're okay. So, it's it's uncovering at many things. One of the things we can see it's making clear here in Thailand is who sex workers are. It's very clear that sex workers are not other people. Yes. Sex workers are all genders, shape, size, religion, and so on. Right. And most sex workers in Thailand and many other places are family mothers and the family provider. They're the ones who ensure the survival of their family and the growth of their family. So COVID is making it crystal clear everywhere that it's this kind of caring. It's the unwaged and low-wage carers who are mostly women who are doing the work 
it keeps us and the whole planet alive. Right. We feel the COVID pandemic falling on top of us all has mm. fallen on top of the climate pandemic, poverty pandemic, mm. what else? War pandemic, yeah. rape pandemic. Um, right. We have many pandemics. So it's the latest one to drop on us and maybe the biggest one. And we see that the COVID virus doesn't discriminate. Even somebody like Prince Charles and Boris Johnson can have it. Right. So the virus doesn't discriminate, but we know that the relief and government assistance okay. packages often discriminate. So in response to the virus here in Thailand, they closed down workplaces, including entertainment places since the 18th of March. And they closed also schools, transport, other things. So sex workers have not been having any income since the 18th of March. Some of the other workers, low wage workers and other workers in society, some people can work from home, but most cannot. And of course, the mothers and carers already work from home unpaid anyway. So their life is usual or not. I was listening to people talking about trying to socially isolate or socially distance yourself. And I'm thinking about anyone who's a mother with a toddler. I don't think you can distance yourself even to try to go to the toilet for five minutes alone is always a challenge. So, yeah, I think the message to distance yourself is, you know, it's a health message, but how can it be applied is not clear. So we're not that different from other workers in Thailand, mm -hmm. except that we've been excluded from labor protection and social security. So we've been working without a safety net. In, instead of the protection laws, uh, Thailand, like many other countries, has concentrated on using criminal law. So the police to arrest us, not the labor protection to support us. And we have the other people wanting to rescue us and lock us up, but not support our right to have a social security. At the moment, the Thai government has promised money for waged workers, whether you're formal worker or, in, or informal, and it uh, is not excluding, sex workers are not excluded from that. Uh, we see that no governments anywhere in the world are talking about relief or wages for the massive load of work being done uh, around COVID in caring for the family. That's still going to be unpaid. And the sex workers who are now isolated in their rooms around the city are still planning, worrying, and managing the family long distance. That work of caring doesn't stop even when the money runs out. It only gets harder. Yes. I think you saw a recent Oxfam report where yes. they valued waged work at $10 trillion. I don't even know how much is $10 trillion. Um, and I think all of us are already thinking, yes, we think, you know, women and carers of all genders should start to get some of that money. We think here it would have been a very different situation if women and other carers were already secure, the family was already secure in cash or in access to land and sex workers had some access to protections and benefits as others. Instead of it being it would have been much more simple process for the government to support what was already happening. Now governments everywhere are scrambling to find solutions at the last minute. Mm -hmm. So we passed through HIV, coup, coup again, coup again, tsunami, yeah. uh, flood, rescue, rescue, <laughs> many things. Mm -hmm. uh, we know sex workers are very resilient. Mm -hmm. And like Katie said, everybody is helping each other. And interestingly, those who want to stop us from working mm. never show up with money in emergency. Yeah. Never come in an emergency with some money. We don't know where they go. Maybe they're in self-isolation in a nice condo somewhere. We don't know. <laughs> and we, as Katie was saying, we're all keeping in touch with each other across the region. Mm. And it's not much different from Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, Burma. We, we're all very much in the same situation. We Thank think you. that the, the, I just finished a little bit. Yeah, 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 please, please go on. Yes, Liz, please go on. Stop me, oh my God. <laughs> no, no stopping you, no. Okay, um, I just wanted to, to say like, 
uh, at the moment, it's like support for life and protection for life. It's just in case of emergency, break glass. Mm. Suddenly, what we were told was impossible. Mm. Like you can't give money, you can't give cash to poor people. Mm. You can't charge less for electricity. Mm. All these things were impossible are suddenly possible. Mm. And we think that these things that we win now, we have to make sure that they don't take back later. Right. We have to be brave enough to take on the state and not work for the state. And that includes anything we win for sexual health and reproductive rights. If we win easier access to abortion, or if we win easier access to our HIV drugs or whatever, we have to fight to make sure they don't take that back later. Right. Um, and if they can recognize sex workers as workers in a crisis, then they have to be able to recognize us every day. Right. So we're part of the global women's strike campaign. It used to be called wages for housework, living wage for mothers, and now it's calling a care income. Mm. The core hasn't changed. It's about getting money to the people that do the core work of caring for the people and the planet. Um, that they must be paid a wage. Where, and that can be cash, it can be access to land, or however people devise it in their own context. And we're, on Friday, we're having a webinar which I will send the details okay. mm -hmm. to discuss the care income and also launching an open letter to all governments mm -hmm. that we will be asking people if they would like to sign on. Mm -hmm. So I would like to send you guys that uh, maybe via email later on. I'm not sure how. Yes. So basically, sex workers at the moment, it's too early in Thailand to see the shape of the problem. Mm -hmm. Will the problem that sex workers confront be different in any way to the problem that uh, street vendors, garment workers, and other workers confront, we don't know yet. It's mm -hmm. too early. Mm -hmm. That's basically <laughs> Thailand from the sky. <laughs> thank, thank you, Liz. Thank you for your very inspiring comments. You put some energy back into me and some hope as well. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, we have uh, Meena Saraswati Seshu, an activist for sex workers' rights uh, from India. Now, over to you, Meena. Hello, my name is Meena Saraswati Seshu, and I work with Sangram, which is a health and human rights NGO in Sangli, Maharashtra. This is a rural uh, NGO. It's a women-centered intervention. The impact of the COVID-19 and the lockdown on the communities that I work with which are primarily sex workers, female, male, and transgender persons in sex work, rural women, and uh, children of sex workers. The problem that the communities that I work with face is one of work. As you know, sex workers are a part of the workforce that are dependent on clients uh, to make a living. And we find that since the lockdown, sex workers have had no clients and uh, many of them, many of them are, are now unable to deal with the fact that um, they are not able to uh, continue their work. In fact, just this morning, unfortunately, one of the workers that we work with actually committed suicide by burning herself because she just could not deal with the tension of no work no clients, her lover not able to come and meet her, and living in isolation in the brothel. So this is having a huge impact on the community. Don't also forget that the way this virus is spreading or the manner of spread, please remember that the brothels are all thickly packed with women. Many of them have gone back to their villages after the awareness program that we did with them. But the ones that are here also live closely packed. If one of them gets um, COVID-19, let me assure you that knowing the way this COVID-19 spreads, it's going to be rampant. The other problem is livelihood, which is that not only are people going to fall ill, we know that a large number of them may not fall critically ill, 
Also, most sex workers are young. But we do have a critical number of sex workers who are old, who live with diabetes, who live with comorbidities, who live with TB. And I have a feeling that we are going to have to face a lot of problems in the future, especially if you're poor. Chances of you getting treatment are very low, very, very low. Caste is also a big issue. Most of the workers we work with belong to the Dalit caste, which then again puts them in further uh, vulnerability. Many of them live with HIV, and so those that are living with HIV are getting medication now. Government has decided to give them medication for two months, but don't forget that without nutrition, that medicine is not going to work on this community. Where is this community going to get its livelihood from is a huge issue for us today. COVID-19 is not easy, is not easy for communities that have to live in packed slum-like situations and who have to earn to be able to eat. There is no way this community is going to weather this easily. We will need state support. We will need the government to step in in a big way to help this community weather this. Thank you. Thank you, Meena. Uh, we have a question from uh, Tin Wong Fu, who is chief editor of Health Digest journal Myanmar and is also a member of APCAT Media Network. Uh, Dr. Fu, would you like to ask a question and please ask just one question. Uh, limit yourself to one question. We are running uh, out of time and many questions lined up. Yes, please. Hello, everyone. Yes. Good afternoon. I would yes. like to ask the, is there any special interventions related to prevention of COVID 19 for uh, 70,000 commercial sex workers of Myanmar by ANSW? Some 14% of uh, them are also living with HIV positive and they are immune deficient, so they need special attention. And they are also social distancing is recommended by the government. Any financial support and help for them? Thank you. Uh, Kathy, would you like to answer that question? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, Thank you, Doctor, uh, for the your question. Uh, for the APNSW, what we do is the yeah. as I already mentioned that we are the regional sex worker network and we are membership based. So in Myanmar, we do have the our yeah. member. We have the our member who are the sex worker led organization and they are working with the, the community to provide the education awareness on the COVID-19 and plus also that they are providing this, the, the needs. You know, is that however we say the authority or whoever is saying the lockdown or the sharp or not to move. As Mina Sishu mentioned that this community, they still need income because they have, uh, they need, they are supporting to their family and a lot of the issue they are facing. So they, they need the support. So what we're doing is that some, most of them, they are still working. However, the close down to the karaoke or massage parlor, they still come in working in the way have the available they can do. So is that our member organization, they are working, they are providing the condom and lubricant as well as the mask and also the san, uh, hand sanitizer and also providing the ministry of health public the, the, the pamphlet. So they are providing going to the brother base and also providing the education awareness, how to do and how to prevent even the uh, difficult time for them. So that's, it's, it's a, I am in the, within the short time, I, I, I can't see that we can support as the APNSW, we can support the financial, but uh, we can provide the information to the, our member organization to how to work in with the community. So they are uh, trying to work, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rita Vidya Dana, uh, who is a very senior journalist from Indonesia, and she's country director for Consortium for Press Freedom and also member of APCAT Media Network. Uh, she wants to ask a question. Uh, so, Rita, over to you. 
Yeah, uh, I have already uh, write uh, in yeah, the please, message. Uh, Alexandra, yes. I want to ask you, uh, uh, Indonesia still has high uh, maternal mortality rate at uh, 305. Uh, one out of nine girls married before they reach 15 years. Unmet need for modern contraception is very high. Do you think that Indonesia will be lag behind in achieving SDGs goals? And do you see the rise of conservatism in Indonesia and elsewhere in Asia Pacific country as a major barrier to accessing uh, sexual reproductive health uh, information and services? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. I think, um, yes, of course, I mean, as of right now, none of the countries are actually on track to achieving any of the goals, but especially um, goal five, which is gender equality, um, and which has underneath it, of course, FGM and early in child forced marriage. Um, but in terms of increasing conservatism in Indonesia, I think it's been something very concerning for quite some time now, especially to, I have a couple of member organizations that are also operating there. And in fact, I know um, there's, we have been sharing that there's of course, increasing criminalization of LGBTIQ people over the last couple of years. Um, and as well, last year, of course, um, the government attempted to pass a new penal code, which of course had many articles which were very concerning for people that work on SRHR. Um, it included uh, criminalizing abortion, um, preventing um, uh, contraceptive distribution and information about contraceptives to young people, um, li limited to consensual sexual acts to um, that within a marriage. So, I mean, if you, of course, if something like this were to get passed, it would have a very um, devastating effect, I think, on uh, the people of Indonesia and as well, the, the, the achievement of SDG goals related to SRHR. Oh. Thank you. Uh, uh, we have a question from Desiree Shiake. She's a nurse in the Ministry of Health, Rwanda. Uh, not in the Asia Pacific region, but still, uh, and I think this is for both of the panelists. Uh, Desiree uh, Desire wants to know, uh, please share strategies to diagnose sexual, sexually transmitted diseases in adolescents early on. Are there any strategies in place? Uh, Alexandra, would you like to take it up? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I'm the right person to actually answer that question because I work on advocacy, but I am not working, I mean, I'm not implementing um, programs at national level in schools or, and I'm also not working in a service delivery organization, but I would really encourage um, uh, access, to, I mean, strong comprehensive sexuality education system it would be um, critical to ensuring that um, young people are able to make decisions for themselves and healthy decisions and keep themselves safe. So um, definitely CSE is very important for that, um, as well as youth friendly services, because there has to be a place for youth to go uh, and feel safe where they can talk to a health practitioner about issues affecting their SRHR. Okay, uh, thank you. We have uh, some, of, some comments here. Uh, uh, some uh, one comment says uh, is thanking Alexa. Ulrika is thanking Alexa for a very useful summary on SDGs and the systemic barriers. Uh, and uh, we have a comment from Liz says heard that the Burmese government got you 32 million euros to help with COVID. How will Myanmar government help people, including sex workers? So that, that is a general question she's asking. And, um, and we have a question from Swapna. Swapna, would you like to ask your question if possible? She's trying to type in her question, but uh, okay. okay. Yes, yes, Swapna, please ask. Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hello. Just wanted to ask uh, how community workers can be empowered 
to help marginalized communities like sex workers access their rights, especially to overcome stigma. Uh, um, can you repeat your question? Okay, so just wanted to know how community workers can be empowered to help marginalized communities like sex workers to access their rights, especially to overcome stigma. Um, uh, okay, go leads. Then I. I think that's a whole other webinar. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that there is a lot of information exactly about that, how you build communities to uh, helping each other. And you can find a lot of that on the APNSW website or NSWP website. I think it's a very important question and it, it takes a lot of, uh, it, yeah, it would take a lot of time. I think Katie may be able to answer more quickly than me. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Liz. Um, I think, you know, is the, they had the two way. It's the trust building is also the very important. As I mentioned earlier, the community, uh, the, the in the civil society or the government have to be acknowledged. The sexual worker community, they have the capacity and they have the uh, ex uh, experience. This is, can think of the, however we are doing moving or movement, we should think about the meaningful participation. That will be the very, uh, that will be the short effective uh, response. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, received a comment from Air, who is uh, based in Maitang in North Thailand, and uh, she runs a small massage parlor outside of Chiang Mai. Her original message is in Thai, and we have just used Google translation for English version. And you can see that, and it basically means that my shop, that is the massage parlor, is now closed as per government orders. And I have no source of income now. I have to stay at home and cannot travel anywhere. Well, I think that's the plight of many of us, not only across the region, but globally as of now. Uh, would any of the panelists want to comment on it? It is a comment actually, but would you like to add something to it? Yes. Can I just answer her in Thai yes. a little bit just to give some cheer up? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> yes. ใช่นะเพื่อนพนักงานบริการหลายคนก็ติดห้องเหมือนกันนะเพื่อนถ้าไม่อะไรก็ติดตัวกับเอ็มมาเวอร์ได้นะก็ไม่รู้ว่าเ
thanks for listening and stay tuned for the next episode bye bye have a good day